I'm just checking who's in the front row because they're the people who always ask the hard questions. So I've got my, my eye on you lot. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's my first time in uh, Bucharest, my first time in, in Romania. So uh, I've had a lovely time so far. Uh, it's a beautiful city. Little Paris, is that right? Something like that. Let me find my thing. Okay, so. So I'm going to be talking about building systems that are never done today. That's this last keynote. So I'm going to turn my phone off before we start. Who's T. Pusky? Hands up. Someone just tweeted. <laughs> and now I'll turn my phone off. So how was the conference? A bit more enthusiasm, come on. How was the conference? Don't make me get you to stand up. Because that's an option as well. So yeah, thanks very much for having me. I'm going to talk about building systems that are never done. So. Um, I'm going to cover off a whole bunch of stuff that hopefully will be familiar to a lot of you, right? So we've got some stuff about Yagni in here, solid, TDD. My opinions may differ from some other people who've been given keynotes. Uh, unit testing, emergent design, a whole bunch of stuff I'll be talking about. But first, actually, what I want to talk about is something slightly different, which is that the future is scary, All right? Um, so. It's interesting because things seem to be moving faster and faster in our industry at the moment. But it's not just in our industry, and we've known about this for a very long time. Part of my guilty pleasures, I guess, is, or one of my guilty pleasures apart from World of Warcraft, is, uh, is physics. So I did physics originally, and I still try and keep a little bit up to date, and I still try and keep up, I still try and read quite a lot around physics and so on. And it's kind of interesting seeing what's happening now in, through the lens of uh, predictions from maybe 40, 50 years ago um, with respect to our industry. So here's a quote from, well, 1958. This is a quote from John von Neumann. Presumably people know who von Neumann is, von Neumann Architectures. Uh, and it was recorded by Stanislaw Ulam, who's a mathematician who worked with him closely at Los Alamos. And he says, Ever accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity. We're approaching some essential singularity. In the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them can't continue. This is this idea that progress is getting faster and faster and faster all the time. I don't know if people in this room have noticed that over the last few years. I'll come on to some examples in a moment. But there's this idea that's been sort of apparent for, you know, quite a long time now, 50 years, of this approaching technological singularity. I also, as part of my guilty pleasure, pleasures, set of them, there is a set of guilty pleasures, clearly, um, like to read science fiction. There's a guy called Charles Stross. He wrote this book called Accelerando, which is about the approaching technological singularity. He's got this really nice idea in this where uh, he, he talks about MIPS uh, per gram, so millions of instructions per second per gram. And at a certain point when uh, MIPS per gram reach a certain level, uh, essentially the solar system will become self-aware. And he, in his book, talks about a few years' time, maybe a couple of decades, when uh, yeah, laboring women produce 45,000 babies a day representing 10 to the 23, sorry, 1,023 MIPS uh, but around the world, fab lines casually churn out the same amount. We're reaching the point quite soon, actually, where, where for the first time ever, more thinking, quote, is going to be done by machines. There's going to be more MIPS in the solar system happening by machines than by humans, which is a sobering thought. This is science fiction. Um, this is science reality, right? So... This is, uh, this is a, uh, basically a, a graph showing um, it's, it's, a, it's a projection of Moore's law. But it's got some interesting facts on here, right? So here we are, where are we? Down here, 2010, somewhere. And at the moment, normalized calculations per second for $1,000 
will get you about, oh, hey, hello, will get you about one insect's brain worth of calculations, all right? But by about 2050, a thousand error, here's, here's a, an article I read recently. Can I pull it down? Where's the, hello, 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 hello? Here. Um, this is an article I read recently, pretty scary. Self-driving trucks are going to hit us like a human-driven truck. Now, this is specifically about the US. They're talking about, within a couple of decades, pretty much all automobiles and trucks are going to be autonomous. Right? And the impact on humanity that that's going to have. Scary stuff. Three million unemployed truckers just in the US, plus all the support staff they're talking about. Um, they're talking about entire towns disappearing because they only exist to provide support for, for truckers. Um, that's kind of interesting, right? And this is, incidentally, this is not science fiction. This is Morgan Stanley. You can't get much further than science fiction than Morgan Stanley making a prediction. And the prediction is, as, as it says up here, phase four, two decades, 100% autonomous penetration. <coughs> Cough, utopian society. I'm not sure about that. There's another quote I quite liked recently, another scary quote from um, Elon Musk. And he was talking about AI. And he said, if you're not worried about strong AI appearing within two to five years, then you're not working closely enough with, with AI teams. How's everyone feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling a bit like this, to be honest. A bit scary. I'm kind of, oh my God, what's just around the corner? I mean, that's all like futureology stuff, and you know, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen. I suspect it probably will, and I suspect it'll happen much faster than we think. But there is stuff that's happening much, much closer to home. I asked a minute ago, you know, who's, who's sort of noticed the pace of change accelerating, right? Um, just with what we do. And I was at a conference a couple of years ago, maybe. I think, actually, no, it was last year. It was um, it's called Go to Aarhus. And some of the feedback from Go to Aarhus was quite interesting because the feedback went along the lines of, hey, no one really told us what was going to happen. No one really gave us any concrete things that we should be doing. No one really gave us any uh, direction. Everyone seemed to be saying, all the speakers seemed to be saying, oh, shrug, we don't really know actually what's around the corner. Shrug, we don't really know what's happening. And I think this is indicative of this just overall speed up in all the sort of technologies that we have to assimilate at the moment, in all the sort of um, the, the rapid growth in different areas, so DevOps, software architecture, and so on. And I mentioned this idea of a singularity. Now, have we got any front ends? I don't know if that's the technical term. JavaScript developers in the room? Well, I mean, I think we already know that pretty much JavaScript is already approaching a singularity, right? And that's kind of, we're already uh, almost there with that. You can't walk past a front-end developer without 18 different, uh, different sort of MVC libraries falling out of their pockets. But at the same time, you know, the coolest thing going by, um, as my colleague Sam Newman says, going by developers' laptops and the stickers on them, we're rapidly approaching this container singularity as well, right? Just huge growth in this area. The VCs are all over this. Just huge amounts of money being spent. So this is Docker. This is you know Mesosphere. This is um, all, all the different um, providers out there, uh, rapidly um, changing the like, well the 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 rapidly changing um, how the software industry is looking at the moment. And, I mean, you know, just finally, log aggregation. As, can anyone understand why there are so many log aggregation tools? I mean, I don't know if people have noticed this, but you could probably name 10 of them off the top of your head, but I can't, I've got a terrible memory. So, you know, we've got this idea of the far future, we've got this idea of a bit closer, so the, you know, the wider kind of population of developers thinking, oh, what's going on? But then even closer to home, closer to my heart in a lot of ways, being, um, I guess the grumpy uncle in some senses of microservices, um, even closer to home, is the fact that we're starting to actually uh, change the way we design and deploy and test software. Right? So we're starting to design systems composed of these collaborating small services. Some of us, when the requirements uh, mean we should do that or doing that, of course, rather than it being a hit everything with a microservices hammer, that's a disclaimer. Um, and, 
part of that is because I think you know Martin and I wrote this article. Uh, hopefully, people have, uh, if not read it, you can go and have a look at it. It's on Martin's site. Uh, incidentally, you know, just saying, I'm first author. <laughs> right. <laughs> just as an aside, the funny thing was, I actually ended up. I went for a sleepover at Martin's house for this. Um, if that if that mean kind of, which is not something I ever thought I'd be, I'd be doing, but I went and yeah, which is very strange. I didn't wear a onesie or anything, but still, yeah. And you know, and this this is this is sort of driven um, uh, a big growth in the idea of building uh, suites of, uh, of systems out of suites of collaborating services. And we talk about different uh, characteristics, componentization, you know, business capabilities, all of these sorts of things. And it should be pointing out that this article we wrote this because this is what we were seeing teams do. This isn't a definition of any particular style. This is a description of some of the characteristics that we were seeing in the wild. As some of those characteristics go, we've got um, design for failure, infrastructure automation. Um, I think those, for me, are two of the most important things, because I think without specifically infrastructure automation and the massive growth of the cloud may be another singularity, if you like, um, the massive, massive growth of the cloud, microservice-based architectures simply wouldn't be possible. Right? That's, my, um, that's my belief. In fact, my colleague Neil Ford, if people have known Neil, he talks about microservices as being uh, the first post-DevOps architectural style. So, you know, without the growth of the DevOps culture, without the idea that we're actually building systems and running them as developers, we're, we're not just handing, building, writing software and handing it over to our colleagues in operations. Um, without that movement, without the growth in, uh, in things like virtualization and uh, infrastructure automation, um, microservices simply wouldn't be possible. But then Dan North doesn't like the word. I know Dan pretty well, I've known him for all a long, long time, in fact, worked with him for five or so years. But Dan talks about microservices as replaceable component architectures. He thinks that microservices is the wrong name, tough, we're stuck with it. Um, that's what Martin does, he names things and it sticks. Um, but you know, Dan thinks that we should be talking about replaceable component architectures, systems that are made up of small parts that can be replaced over periods of time. All right. So that's, I mean, that's another way maybe of thinking about microservices. Now, I know my talk was called you know, building software that's never done. Um, so what does that kind of mean, really? What, what, it, I think it ties in with this idea of replaceability in software. It ties in with the idea that we should be able to replace bits of, of, of our systems over a period of time. What it doesn't tie in with is this. Right, so this is the definition of incomplete. When we say never done, we're going to build a system that's never done. We don't mean we're going to build only parts of it and then, uh, you know, and then and then we're done. Never done in that sense. Really, what we sort of mean is never done in a slightly different sense. So I saw a great talk by Chad Fowler on 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 microservices, and he he had this nice idea about reclaiming the word legacy. Right? Legacy has terrible connotations in software. Legacy has awful connotations. L you know, there's the Mike Feathers definition. Legacy software is software that, um, that essentially is valuable but isn't covered by tests. I'm sure people are aware of that. But it has this negative connotation, legacy. What Chad was talking about was the idea that we should be reclaiming legacy to make it s the word, to make it serve its original purpose which is that we, we, will, you know, we will leave a legacy, we leave a legacy for our children, and hopefully that's a good thing. Hopefully that's you know, maybe property, or maybe it's um, some kind of wealth that we've accrued. Um, what we don't do is, we hope, leave lots of debt, um, which is the sense that uh, in software we use legacy. So I like the idea that what we're trying to do with, uh, with microservices is build systems that are gonna leave a legacy, a positive legacy. I'm not, sure if, I'm, I'm not sure if Terry Pratchett is well known in Romania, but this is a book by Terry Pratchett. He's a British fantasy author who sadly died a, couple of, a few months ago now. It's called The Fifth Element. Um, and he's got a lovely description in this of something he talks about, which is well, one of the characters who's a dwarf talks about his father's, sorry, his family's axe. And this is the description of my family's axe. So this, my lord, is my family's axe. We have owned it for almost 900 years. Of course, sometimes it needed a new blade. 
Sometimes it's required a new handle. But is this not the 900-year-old axe of my family? And because it has changed gently over time, it is still a pretty good axe. And I think that's what we want to be trying to do with building software systems. We want to be building systems that leave a legacy, building software systems that can be replaced in small increments over a period of time. And microservices actually help with that, I believe. The problem with microservices, or rather the promise of microservices, is that they should be basically cheap to replace. You should be able to take bits out and throw them away. You should be able to scale parts of them very, very quickly. Right? It should be easy to scale. And they should be uh, able to withstand failure, so built to be resilient. All of these require a whole bunch of software engineering techniques and so on. And if we can do this, it should allow us to go as, as fast as possible, as fast as we can. And this is a quote from Adrian Cockcroft, who's former VP engineering at, at Netflix, who popularized this style, uh, if you don't know of it. Everyone knows about Netflix these days, right? I don't know. <laughs> um, so the problem I've got, though, because I've been, I mean, I should introduce myself a bit. I'll do it in, in, in the future. But I'm kind of, I describe myself as a coding architect. So I spend, because I have to describe myself as something, right? I mean, our clients won't pay us unless I describe myself as something. And unlike Tim Berners-Lee, I can't get away with web developer, which apparently is his, on his CV, which is pretty amazing. Um, he invented the whole thing, just so you know. Um, so I've come up with coding architect. And what that means for me is I spend probably 70% of my time on teams writing code, either in a, maybe a leadership position or often, more often than not, kind of sitting at the back offering Socratic advice when people would like to hear it. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I do, which means that I've seen over the last four years quite a lot of projects implemented or implementing a microservices style. Um, and the things that we find or have found difficult are these particular things, right? So end-to-end -end testing, really, really tough. It's really, really hard. I'll come on to that in a sec. Um, independent deployment um, of, of the individual microservices. This is also tricky. How do you avoid the problem of building something called a distributed monolith? We've got all these individual services, but we have to deploy them all at once or version them all at once. That's kind of quite tricky. And then, I guess, somewhat related to those two things, how do you evolve services? How do you do service versioning? And these are all pretty tricky. And this is part of the scary feature, actually. This is part of the, you know, when we're starting to build these decomposed systems, how do we manage uh, things that we know how to do, right? We know how to deploy software. We use continuous delivery, right? We check in. Uh, this stuff, our software goes through a nice staged build pipeline. We run fast tests or fast build. We might run some acceptance tests. We might run some user journey tests. We might run some integration tests. And then we might automatically push into production environment. We know how to do that when it's one thing, right? Similarly with testing, right? Testing microservices is fundamentally difficult. And I know Bearing in mind, I tend to speak more often than not at software architecture conferences. So um, to avoid confusion and to avoid a kind of Vim versus Emacs style argument over what to call types of tests, I've settled on small, medium, and large, right? Is that OK with everyone? I hope it's OK. Um, writing large tests from microservices is tricky. Right? Because you, know, you have to instantiate, you have to run lots of independent processes. Without tooling, that's a hard thing to do. Writing large tests that test from the outside is difficult. So a lot of people now, actually, what they're doing is rather than, rather than doing that, rather than have these large tests to test concrete implementations, we're moving to the idea of using fakes. And there's tooling around to support that, which I'll talk about. So or, yeah, lots, um, many organizations are moving to testing with, against stops in, uh, in, in their build pipelines. So writing lots of unit tests, um, but not so many. Going back to the, the actual, you know, the original test pyramid rather than the snow cone or the hourglass or whatever people have been, whatever, whatever meme is currently popular. So this is one thing that's really quite hard. Is it OK to actually move towards this model where we're writing lots of unit tests, uh, not really testing how our services are integrating with other parts of our system, moving away from having true end-to-end -end, uh, tests? The other thing that's really tricky 
is integration and deployment with microservices. Right? So imagine these pink lines, for argument's sake, are build pipelines. I presume people know what a build pipeline is, so I won't go into that. But essentially, this is a, uh, this is a process that each piece of our software that is, is going to go through before it gets into production. And normally what we would do, as I say, is have some kind of integration stage, right? We'd have some integration stage where we test things together. Maybe we have an integration environment that we put everything into. And then we test. We run end-to-end -end tests against it. So this kind of idea. We've got some kind of integration environment which we push our software into. Now the problem comes when you've got lots and lots of build pipelines all fanning in to this one integration environment to run a set of integration tests. Because we end up with this kind of race condition, or set of race conditions, essentially. Right, so what happens if I've got, if I make a change to the first piece of software, the first pipeline that, that's running through the first pipeline, and it upgrades, you know, it bumps the version to build 39. But in production, you know, um, it needs to run against build 28 of service B, build 15 of service C, build uh, 289 of service D, there's been a lot of work going on with service D, et cetera, et cetera, right? So how do we manage, how do we manage the complexity of lots of different versions of software moving through these independent pipelines? I mean, you could have an integration environment per, you could actually have an integration test and an integration environment per build pipeline, per service. But then what do you do? Do you have like a copy of the production dependencies it has and the snapshots? It's a really hard problem to solve. And people are solving it in a slightly different way. Um, but I'm not going to tell you about that, because I think I'm done. I just thought I'd leave you there. Is that all right? Thanks very much. Please have the applause now. Right. <laughs> ha, 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 James. Yeah, well. Um, so, as I say, you know, I, I usually speak at, sort of, uh, at architecture conferences and the, you know, the, um, uh, that kind of style of event. So. When I was asked to speak here, I was A, very excited, because I'd heard really good things, but also slightly terrified, because, you know, us pointy-headed software architects, what do we know about software craftsmanship? You know, I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm a member, necessarily, of the software, software craftsmanship community. So I was thinking, this is me thinking now, So I was thinking, what is it about software craftsmanship that I think applies in this kind of space? What do I, what do I understand about software craftsmanship for a start? And so I had a look, and I kind of thought, well, maybe I'll start with this, which turns out, turns out there's a manifesto. Who knew? Well, I did, actually, so don't worry. Um, this is obviously the craftsmanship manifesto. And the first two things stood out. So um, not only working software, but also well-crafted software. It's kind of interesting. Um, relates to a lot of the patterns I had right at the start in my first slide. So, you know, kind of solid and Yagni and Kiss and uh, all these kinds of things. And then the second one, steadily adding value. I thought, well, that seems to relate quite well to the idea of software that's never done, doesn't it? We're steadily replacing our software over time. We're steadily adding value. As we discover more, we're, doing, we're adding new stuff. We're replacing bits that we've already written with better implementations. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So we've got this idea of well-crafted software and this idea of steadily add adding value. So I'm going to digress a little at this point. Don't worry, there's no more science fiction yet, I should point out. Um, I don't know if people know, but I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. So ThoughtWorks, you should know, because I'm wearing the branding. <laughs> that's corporate warrior style. Um, so I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. I've been very lucky to work for them for about 10 years. And when I joined, um, I'd been doing some unit testing and I'd come across cruise control and continuous integration and these kind of things. And as I say, you know, I've been there about 10 years. And, and over that period of time, I've had the great fortune to work with a whole bunch of really awesome people. So some of these may be familiar, some of them might not be. Um, so there's Dan North, there's Liz Keogh, um, there's Nat Price, there's Steve Freeman, there's a whole bunch of people who have become pretty well known um, in the software engineering, software development, uh, software craftsmanship worlds, right? So around test-driven development, around behavior-driven development, about how you write tests, around uh, the, the kind of mockist ideas about writing tests and so on. 
And that's kind of awesome, right? Because fundamentally, ThoughtWorks remains, was and remains fundamentally uh, an XP shop. All right, we're, we're an ex extreme programming shop. We pair programming all our projects. Uh, but we pair in lots of other roles as well. In fact, bizarrely, and a lot of people think this is pretty bizarre, uh, our management, our global management team, pairs. So, in fact, more than pairs, we've got four CEOs. We have a four in the box for CEOs. Um, so we kind of believe in this, and it goes all the way up and all the way down. You know, I mean, if you haven't seen this, this is the old XP diagram. It sort of indicates that all the different practices are interlinked, interrelated. Uh, you can't, you don't get all the benefit of doing XP unless you get, unless you do all of the practices, essentially. If you take one out, then you don't get all the benefit. And wh whilst I was at, whilst I've been at ThoughtWorks working with these people, you might recognize this. This brings me back to what I was talking about earlier, right? Because this is all the stuff that I sort of, quote, grew up doing inside ThoughtWorks. And, I, and World of Warcraft is on there because, yes, we have our own guild. Um, so, you know, as I say, Agile, Solid, BDD, Grasp, all these sort, sorts of things were sort of drummed into me um, over certainly the first sort of five years, um, working with, with Dan and Liz and Ivan Moore and all these other people. And I was thinking, back to the thinking meme, I was thinking, does this still make sense? Does this still make sense in, in this world where software is really, really changing fast, where we're building distributed systems composed of really small, independent, independently scalable, replaceable uh, components? What does testing look like? What do these patterns look like? What do these ideas look like? Does this still make sense? And then I thought a bit more. And I remembered an old story about the Apollo moon landings. Bear with me. All right. So the inter interesting thing about Apollo is that over a period of uh, a decade beforehand, they essentially adopted kind of an incremental approach, almost a concurrent set-based engineering approach to getting someone on the moon. It wasn't as if they just went all out and designed uh, the Apollo uh, lander and the Saturn V rocket. What they did is they kind of scattered and built a whole bunch of different solutions to try and solve to try and converge and come together on an overall solution. And way back at the start, when they had the Gemini uh, program, which was one of the initial ones, the Gemini program was kind of interesting because initially what they wanted to do, and bearing in mind NASA at this point was composed of mainly aeronautical engineers and rocket scientists left over from, from the war, right? From the Second World War. So what they decided to do with the Gemini capsule is this. And this is real. So they're going to fire this thing up into space, right? And it's got people inside this. And you know, the, the, the astronauts are pilots, obviously. That's where they came from, the pilot. They were pilots originally, went through an astronaut training scheme. And they had aeronautical engineers designing things. And they thought, well, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to get this capsule back by dropping it through the atmosphere. And when it gets to a you know, certain height, we're going to open a hang glider wing. It's honestly, this is actually true. And some little wheels will pop out, and then we'll land it. So that was, that was the idea that they came up with. And that's, that's the Gemini capsule attempting to land, should we say? Now, the interesting thing happened here was a project manager turned up, and this program ran for a period of time. And they had many, maybe one success, many, many failures, as you'd imagine. And this project manager turned up, and he said, well, so what, are you, what are you all doing with this hang glider thing? And they said, well, we, know we thought we could land it, and the pilots can guide it down, and we can do all this cool stuff. And the project manager said, you're insane. Why don't you just drop it on a parachute? Right? And that's a true story. What they did is they got rid of that, and still to this day, most rockets land via parachute, apart from the shuttle. And that got me thinking. I thought, well, that's interesting. Because there's some kind of outside factor involved here, right? There's some kind of chunking up, some kind of process where someone who's not in this kind of small, closed environment, focused very, very clearly on a particular project, um, Someone who came in and just said, no, nah, maybe, maybe there's something else that we can learn in this space. And as I say, I was thinking about all these different patterns, and I thought, well, maybe it's turtles all the way down, right? Or up. Maybe if we take a look at some of these patterns with respect to 
Uh, maybe microservices, or maybe architecture. Maybe we'll learn something. Maybe they'll still be applicable, maybe they won't. So if it's okay, that's what we're gonna do. So the first one we're gonna talk about is everyone's favorite and mine, uh, Yagni. Now, I'm sure people have come across Yagni. This is, you know, um, uh, uh, you ain't gonna need it. And this is often applied in situations, I mean, it's a bit dangerous, Yagni, because you can apply Yagni uh, to kind of just cut off people's arguments about design and about needing to do some thinking up front. And in fact, when you're building microservices, you often need to do some thinking up front because you have to think about things like APIs. How are you going to talk to external systems? What integration tools are you going to use? Um, but Yagni is still a very, very useful tool. And I'll explain why. Oh, there's a, Martin has just released an article where he talks about the different, um, I guess, failure modes of Yagni. Um, the in interesting one here, is the idea of the cost of carry of code or of a feature. So, you know, you build a feature that you don't need right, right now, or you even write an individual, you, know, you declare a variable that you don't need right now, and going forwards, there is a cost associated with that feature in your code base or with the variable in your code base. This is the cost of carry associated with Yagni. But what does it mean in terms of building distributed systems? So, I mean, this is obviously what a distributed system looks like. We've got that green blob at the top, which is an individual service. Yagni applies in this case because the, one of the great things about microservices is, A, you, can def you should defer the decision to create them until the right point. You can make your own minds up on what the right point is. Um, but you don't have to design everything up front. You can make a small part, and then as you go, you can build in extra services. So in this case, kind of, I think, kind of Yagni still applies, right? You build out the distributed system as you need parts of the distributed system, rather than just going off specifying it and building it out all at once, until eventually you end up with some kind of, this is, again, this is what a real distributed system looks like. So that's my first point, I think. You know, we sh the idea is that we should build out these services as we need them. And this is related to the idea of should we start off building a monolith or microservices. A lot of the time, starting off building something that's uh, slightly monolithic and well modularized makes sense, especially if you're exploring your domain or, uh, or, um, or you know, because you might need to refactor across service boundaries and so on, um, or you need to get into, uh, into production really, really fast there's going to be a cost associated with building out a distributed system that you might not want to pay. But Yagni kind of applies. The next thing is grasp, in the sense of the grasp patterns. Now, this is an old one, so hands up who, who's come across grasp. We've got a, a few hands up. So this is uh, by a guy called Craig, Craig Larman who came up with this. And these are the general responsibility assignment in software patterns. Right? And I'm only going to talk about two of these patterns, but they kind of form the basis for a lot of the academic work on patterns that came later, including Goff. So here's an example of these patterns in action, actually based on uh, a real-world example. So this is based on two teams, one in London, one in India, building some software out. And what they built out was two different parts of the system. One built out fulfillment, one built out, say, retail, selling stuff and fulfilling things. Maybe it's cards. And interestingly, what they ended up with as an architect, this is how I, drew, I draw architecture diagrams. Um, Simon's been beating me around the head for years now, but uh, it's still not working. So this, this is a message bus in the middle. And what happened is, you know, retail, when something was sold, would send a message on to something in fulfillment and something would be fulfilled. Maybe a product would be sent out or a train ticket sent out. And the nice thing about this is this implements kind of the grasp patterns because two of the fundamental patterns in grasp are these two, high cohesion and low coupling. Right? When we're building out software, this is what we're aiming for at the class level and this is what we're aiming for at a uh, domain-driven design um, bounded context level um, and at a capability level. So these kind of hold as well, which is nice. And by the way, just saying, if people don't know what Conway's law is, that will make no sense and we'll move on. So the next one is dry. Now, this is obviously at the heart of how we keep our code clean. Don't repeat yourself. 
what does dry mean in the context of building distributed systems? If you've split something up, should we still you know, uh, follow the kind of dry principle across all of our services? And actually, I don't think we should. Honestly, I think within services, we should keep them dry. So within services, we should avoid duplication. But I'm absolutely fine with duplication of business code, of domain objects, across services, including and up to the use of cut and paste. I'll let that one sink in. You all got, you've all, I just said it's OK to cut and paste, right? You, just, you understood that. Good. Cool. And the reason is, um, the reason is that services will diverge over time. Even if you try and extract, if you try and extract domain logic out into a common location, what you, all you'll end up doing is tying these different separate code bases together uh, with binary dependencies. And that ends up as a complete nightmare. It's better to have some idea of something called maybe a service template. I'm following the guidelines here on having some, at least some code in a talk at a craftsmanship conference. This, does this count? This doesn't count as code, does it? But the idea is that you have some kind of service template which you can clone services from. And that will contain all the infrastructure stuff that you don't want to duplicate. So maybe it's your monitoring, maybe it's your alerting, maybe it's your status pages. All this sort of stuff can be, uh, can be included in a template which you can use. But even those will diverge. Because essentially, over time, software will, these services will diverge from each other. Even if they start off being really similar, over time they will go down the bifurcating trousers of reality. Thank you to Terry Pratchett again. So that's another principle. Dry with, within services, duplication between. So next up, and I'm going to speed up now because I've realized I've got about 200 slides to go. Just saying. Test-driven development. We'll skip over this. Who cares about this, right? So as I said, you know, I was really lucky. Um, I, I grew up writing software with these two guys, Steve Freeman and Nat Price. And they wrote this book called uh, Goost, which is a fantastic book. And um, Mike Feathers describes this as the London School of Test-Driven Development. And uh, you know, for me, test-driven development is, is not, it's not about the word test. It's about design. I much prefer test-driven design. That's, for me, why I like writing my test first. Yes, I get the byproduct of verification later on and regression and all that kind of good stuff and safety um, but I get I get a much cleaner design personally um, that might be because I'm stupid and you're all much much smarter than I am but that's that's how I end up with good designs which brings me on to this question should we write unit tests at all now I know this is a fairly uh, debated question at the moment in various parts of the industry not looking at anyone in the audience in particular at all as I say, you know, I worked with a whole bunch of people that have been involved in the testing space. I've, I've created testing frameworks and so on. And the interesting thing is when you talk to them, they're very much on the, on the side of you write tests when you, when you need to, when you've got critical um, parts of your application that you need to test at the unit level and so on. But the interesting thing with all of these folks is and this is the Dreyfus model, is that they're all experts at writing tests. They're experts at test-driven development. Between them, they've probably got a couple of hundred years' worth of experience writing unit tests and writing code tests first. So if Jay Fields says these days, OK, only 20% of the time I actually use test-driven development, the rest of the time I'm in a REPL, that's fine. But Jay Fields has spent 15 years right, getting to that point. For me, it's probably because I generally write Java and I don't have access to a REPL, it's probably more than that. It's probably 50, 60%, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but I still, I still use tests and test first as a, as a really um, important part of my toolkit. And that's not to say that I keep all the tests I write hanging around. Sometimes if I'm designing code through tests, I might throw those tests away afterwards. Um, but I still think it's a really important part of the toolkit. So, should we write tests? I think it's more important than ever for me, especially when we consider the idea of microservices and how difficult it is to test, to do systems integration testing. So next, solid. So this is, disc I can just, well, this is particularly the single responsibility principle. So, <laughs> yeah. <sighs> this is in a normal font size, obviously. Um, 
This is an old friend of mine, Alistair, actually, he's at neo for j now. And this is, I mean, this is, a, this is a restatement of the single responsibility principle, which originally said, you know, you should, a, cl a class should have a single reason to change. Now, what we've sort of come up with is this idea that it should be no bigger than your head. You should be able to understand everything about a class in its entirety, rather than the head against the screen. You know, what does that mean? Well, actually, you can chunk up from a class, right? You can chunk up to maybe an individual service. You should be able to understand that. You should have a single responsibility single reason to change, you can chunk up to groups of services, and you can chunk up to services across different teams. Each of these levels, as you chunk up these levels, should have a single responsibility, single reason to change, you should be able to understand them all. So, that's a, another restatement for you. SRP, no bigger than my head. Now, finally on these, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. I'm gonna give you an example of KISS. So this is from the ThoughtWorks technology radar. And in our radar this time around, we put application servers on hold, which is, well, we don't have an avoid status, but pretty much, it's pretty much that, right? So avoid application servers. And why is that? Well, these days, we don't need them. We don't need application servers. We can do everything that application servers do in a much simpler way. They often get in the way of us testing. They often get in, us, get in the way of us uh, deploying easily. They're just difficult to work with. They're complicated. And we don't want complicated software. And I was thinking a bit more about this, and then I thought, I can sum this up in four letters. And it's this, WWJD. And that stands for, what would Joe do? <laughs> it's true. This is, this is how I think about keeping it simple. So Joe Warns is a guy who used to work at ThoughtWorks as well. He's, he's now in the US. And his his awesome talent is, is to see the simplest possible solution to a problem, whether that's guided through tests or whether that's just in an, an innate thing. Um, an example of that, Joe needed a uh, HTTP server to do some WebSocket stuff, right? So Joe's like, well, I could use one of these quite heavy implementations that does WebSockets, or I could write my own. So he did. He went off and wrote his own. And it's a tiny, tiny little HTTP server that also does um, web sockets. Really, really small, hardly any lines of code. Now, that might sound insane. Why would you write your own server? Right? Why would you write your own HTTP server? But the point is this does only one thing. This does only the thing that Joe wants. Really, really simple. This is the idea of keep it simple, stupid. The simplest thing that works. This is an example from myself, which is, and I really, I really, really do have to move on, which is uh, a, an example of blue-green deployment. So this was implemented using cron, Python, Botto, PyDot, and Graphers, and it was in response to an enterprise saying, we need to know what our production environments look like. So rather than going off and buying a whole bunch of expensive uh, SaaS products, or maybe Dynatrace or something, rather than doing that, we just knocked something up. This took like two days, there's a bit of Python, query some APIs in Amazon, and you can just produce uh, something that's simple, uh, does the job, simplest possible thing. So do the simplest possible thing. What about testing and deployment? So we can solve some of these problems with testing and deployment, right? We can do things like semantic monitoring. This is where you run in production uh, some tests that you have, smoke tests or uh, you know, journey tests against your real systems. You obviously have to put in some extra header information to make sure your systems know that it's tests, but you can kind of do that. And what about things like testing against real versions of services? You know, we've already said using stubs in part of your build pipeline is a useful idea, and lots of people are going there. But then you can layer on things like consumer-driven contract testing on top of this. So con consumer-driven contract testing is where we um, is where we provide, the, the consumer of a service provides a contract to that service so that uh, the service knows when it's making, making a breaking change. And crucially, those are executable. So the contracts are executable. So you write some expectations, you hand them off to the, to the other service, to the provider that you're talking to, um, and they run those as part of your build pipeline. So this is another thing we can use in order to layer on tests, a layer on safety whilst moving away from having things like integration environments. And there's an example, Pact is a, which is there, Pact is a, a Ruby-based framework for doing this. Similarly, I mentioned the scary thing, testing in production. 
A lot of teams are starting to do this now, moving actually QA past, right, UAT past, past deployment into a production environment. But that relies on a couple of things, things like good monitoring, and it relies on fast remediation. So, you know, here be danger, folks. This is where a lot of people are moving to, but don't necessarily go out straight away and do this until you've built up some expertise. What about changing services independently? I've got 30 seconds left by my count and 20 slides, so that's good news. Um, changing services independently. So there's an interesting thing from um, this book, Managing the Flow of Technology, where they graph out how likely it is for you to have a conversation with someone depending on the distance away from them that you are, right? So in this, this graph, it's pretty much when you get to about 10 to 12 meters, you, you're, the, the, the likelihood that you'll talk to someone on a weekly basis is about zero, about work. Like the further away you are from someone, the less that you're likely to talk to them. So that has an implication on how you design your organizations with services, right, and the tools you use. For example, between different companies, you know, we want to be investing in things like semantic versioning. So we want to make sure we've got stable APIs, right? When we're talking about between teams, right, where the communication bandwidth is a bit greater, we want to be using other patterns, things like contract testing. We want to be using consumer-driven contracts, and we want to be using tolerant readers. And then if you're on the same team where you can just talk to one another, you might not want to invest in things like consumer-driven contracts because that has a, a cost associated with writing those contracts. Instead, you might rely on conversational change. If people are sitting next to you, hey, I'm changing this interface. Uh, do you mind if you change yours as well? So the distance you are away from people um, has, a, has a big impact on, on the sorts of tools you can use to manage change and the sorts of tests that you have to write, the sorts of patterns you deploy. So as I said, the death of the integration environment. Well, I'm going to clear this up. There's a very simple, uh, actually this counts as code. Pretend, uh, pretend that's a statement of some description. Production doesn't equal live. Now this is a big shock to most ops teams, but if you go into the cloud, production doesn't necessarily mean live. Now, moving away from the idea of having a data center with a limited number of resources where you would upgrade maybe one version and then swap. All right, moving away from that idea of having the limited resources to saying that actually our production environment is effectively an infinite pool. All right, we can deploy lots of versions into production and we can test them in production. We can have our QAs and product managers and our smoke tests. All right, testing in production. We can release canary builds. We can do A-B testing in production. But it's only when we actually flick the switch to make something live that we should be worrying. So there's a real difference, I think, in how we've started to think over a period of time about what production looks like, what live means, what integration means, and whether we need integration environments. So as I said at the start, right, the future is pretty pretty scary because you know this, we're learning how to do this and I think one of the things about craftsmanship is that we're always learning right we have to be always learning the industry is, doesn't stand still um, we can't afford not to keep learning and at the moment what we're learning how to do in the microservices world uh, anyway is this sort of stuff so we're learning how to well craft my family's axe right we're learning how to build software that can be replaced over a period of time that can be upgraded over a period of time without having to replace the whole thing. We're learning how to deploy things independently uh, without having to um, you know, deploy everything into an integration environment. We have all these version conflicts and things. And we're learning how to test these microservices in isolation, but also test them actually in production. As I said, that doesn't necessarily mean live. But on the other hand, right, the future's pretty bright if you think about it. Because there's a whole bunch of stuff we already know. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we can apply going forwards. And these include things like single responsibility, grasp patterns, you aren't gonna need it, you know, KISS, test-driven development, in my opinion, um, and you know, things like don't repeat yourself. These are still valid, and they're still valid at the level of individual 
pieces of code and they're valid at the level of uh, uh, services that, inter that interact with one another, microservices. But then there's a whole bunch of new stuff we can learn as well. And hey, that's going to make us excited, right? There's a bunch of new things to learn. These ideas of contract, because consumer-driven contracts, doing things like semantic monitoring, uh, semantic versioning, testing in production. So, I guess some final thoughts. Oh, boo. I guess one of the things I've sort of thought, been thinking about putting this together is that this idea that craftsmanship isn't actually just in the code, it isn't at the level of the method or object. It's also in the bits around it. It's also in how clean your build is. It's in how clean your interfaces are. It's in how you talk to other services. It's in how we integrate with other services. So software craftsmanship has become and is becoming um, about all of this stuff. So what we need to do sometimes, like the team that we're trying to build a hang glider on top of a space capsule, right, is we need to chunk up we need to chunk up from just a bit of code that we're in and start thinking about the gaps, start thinking about the, the software that's in between the individual uh, applications that we're running. And finally, what would Joe do? And Joe would always do the simplest thing possible. Right? So on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. Go forth, craft some software. Stroke, drink beer. <laughs> Thank you. There's a great slide. There you go. Now you can do it. <laughs> I don't know if we. I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, I'm more than. Uh, yep. Cool. I can take questions now, and I'm also going to be in the drinks later. So. Uh, come and see me then as well. Yes, at the front. So an example of the difference between going live and just being in production, because uh, clearly uh, that was a, a little throwaway thing at the end, just to freak everyone out, right? Um, yeah, I can give you a concrete example of that. So. Um, Probably the best example I know, which is which may be familiar, is how Netflix deploy these days. I don't know if people are familiar with Net Do you, is Netflix in Romania? Out of interest, it's not. Okay, so I mean, obviously, it's pretty popular in many other countries. Um, so the way Netflix deploy is that they've got their actually they they deploy into Amazon. So they've got maybe I don't know tens of thousands of nodes running in Amazon. Um, you can't really recreate tens of thousands of nodes as a performance testing environment or an integration testing environment. So they've moved to this idea that uh, when they deploy a new version, they just push it out. It's in production. So you have version one in production. Um, they'll push out version two or, and maybe version three. And people will have a look at them and make sure they're running OK. But there will be no traffic going to them. So traffic will only be going to version one. And then maybe over time, what they'll do is say, um, will swap 1% of traffic to version 2 and have 99% of traffic on version 1 and will monitor the heck <laughs> out of it. <laughs> so they're monitoring the heck out of it at 1% of traffic. And if, if things look good, and incidentally, they, they wanna, they've got a, I think SLA is too strong a word, but their guideline is they want to know of a problem in production or problem with one of their services within, um, I think it's five seconds. So, and they've got thousands upon thousands of nodes running, right? So they'll swap 1% of traffic. If there's no problem, they might switch some more, and then they might run some A-B tests against them. And this is all automated. If the, if the A-B tests are successful, they will then migrate more of the traffic. And they'll do this over a period of time. And one of these services may have 10 different versions, quote, in production. But they won't all be getting traffic. And the old ones are still hanging around. The interesting thing, if people come from a garbage collected uh, language like Java or so on, um, they garbage collect, they mark and sweep. So older versions that are running in production, they actually mark and sweep those and say, um, they, you know, they just leave them. They might have 10 old versions running, 
but then they've got an automated process that goes through and culls them over a period of time if they're not getting traffic. Yeah. So that, that would be an example. Another example I can give, uh, I do tend to ramble in quest with questions, so sorry. Um, the, another example was the blue-green deploy. I didn't really have much time to show you. But with that blue-green deploy, what that was showing was um, there was gray, uh, blue, and green clusters. And gray was an old version. Uh, blue was the current, was the version currently getting traffic. Green was the new version. And then as they swapped colors, that was the DNS switch happening. So for me, I guess it's whether you're, if it's live, it's live if it's getting traffic. If, you, if it's getting real production load from your real production users, it's live. If it's just sitting around in a production environment, production environment, then it's not live. And it's safe to do it, right? Well, I'd go so far as to say staging doesn't exist anymore, right? So you merge staging and production, yeah. 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 Any more questions? I'm sure there are. Come on. Or is the beer calling you? Beer. Any more questions? Yes, one over there. So the question is, how do you handle a state effectively? How do you handle states? Do you remember what I said right at the start about the hard questions coming from the front row? That's one of the hard questions. Um, so it, with, with difficulty, actually. It's, and it's similar to the question of how do you handle schema migrations in schemaless databases? What you end up having to do is handle it in your code. Right? So you end up having to write code, extra code, to handle the fact that that, they, that you've got states stored somewhere, um, and as you migrate these different services, as you upgrade the different services, they might be talking to, say, an older version or a newer version. Um, which is, you know, it, it's similar to feature toggling, essentially. It's almost like data toggling, I guess. Any more? Great, well, thank you all very much. Um, I hope you really enjoyed that and had a great conference, and I'll see you all again another time. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.